Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first of the two days worth of uh, security uh, track sessions. Uh, as I was just saying, this is a little bit more of the um, security 101. What is it? Why you need to know it? Who's looking for you? Why are they looking for you? And where you can get the basics to actually start securing your system. Okay, I will leave it to Philip and some of the guys will be coming later to scare the shit out of you with the various things. Uh, last year during the security masterclass in Atlanta, I got up and I proceeded to show a tool of how they find you called Shodan, which I'll put in here. Um, Nir got up to talk. We did a quick search in Shodan on the screen for Polycom phones. Uh, within 60 seconds of Nir putting Polycom found phones on the system, somebody in the room had hacked in using the default username and password to a Polycom phone. So from on the screen to into the system was under 60 seconds. Okay, so first rule is do not use default username and password. And remember, your phones all have them. Okay, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a new grandfather. I've been doing the VoIP fraud prevention uh, discussions, as I said, for a bit over four years. Uh, I'm in telecom now. Never mind. Um, 20 plus years, uh, having worked at MCI back when it actually was its own company. Now I think it's part of Verizon. Um, and various others. Uh, I write articles, I blog about technology and travel, uh, and I do various photography. You'll find things on the Astrakhan, um, Google Plus, or Facebook pages that I've put up already from this conference. Okay? Uh, but I lied. You, you do get it one picture because I had this great shot of me with my grandson in the Denver shirt. So it just seemed appropriate to put it up here uh, as an opportunity to advertise him in Denver. Okay. A little bit about what's going on with telecom fraud uh, and the various problems going on. Now, first off, there is a formal organization that does the monitoring and is involved with checking this out called the CFCA. They do a survey every two years. It's an organization that was created with AT&T, MCI, the FBI, the GSM Association, and has grown to 50 or 60 major carriers and 100 little ones. And they do the survey every year. Um, so. Back in 2011, their survey said that telecom fraud overall was an $11 billion industry. And I'll come back to that in a second. It went up to uh, $46 billion uh, in the 2013 survey, and they made a couple of changes in how they do this. But that's a 15% increase in two years. Typical frauds that mostly influence the people in this room. How many of you are here as telecom providers, ITSPs? One, two, three, four, five, six. So the rest of you are probably integrators or handle enterprise products for your own companies. Is that a good guess? Okay. So the ones that affect both of you. Okay. Compromised PBXs, $5 billion in 2013. Internal or inter uh, employee fraud was another 1.5. 1.44 billion. Okay. These are the frauds that are directly targeting your system. The other systems and other types of fraud, I'm sorry, that was 11. It's now gone up, okay, more than doubled in that period of time. Okay. Now, the types of fraud that they study are very different. So when they look at these things, it's who's doing hardware fraud, who's doing arbitrage fraud, who's doing all sorts of things that are specifically carried at ITSPs or carriers. Okay. This is a large part of it. But the bulk of the room here is people who handle things at the enterprise level. So that's pretty much where I'm going to concentrate. Why do they attack? Okay, now, This is a, a little wordy, so I'll give it to you very simply. Hackers go and set up premium rate numbers, the equivalent of 1-900 numbers in other countries. Okay, They then set these things up, break into a system over the, a night or a weekend, use a computer to auto-dial hundreds of calls an hour, racking up a huge amount of money. And they wire transfer the money back to them. Because it's not against the law. The people in Latvia don't care where the call came from or whose system it was. Eventually, the local carrier has to pay them off. They don't care. So the money gets siphoned through, comes through PayPal, comes through all sorts of other things. And literally, what they are doing is, okay, they're taking your 1900 prefixes or a civil equivalent. They break, in, break, break into the phones. And what makes this so profitable is a number of companies that are now currently offering premium rate number services where you don't have to be physically located in the country where the premium rate number is. 
It used to be you wanted a 1-900 number in the United States. You needed to have a, a US-based billing address, bank account here in the States to pay them. Now you can set it up anywhere in the world and you can do it over the internet. Nobody cares. Okay? Who pays for all of this uh, loss? Okay? In most cases, the customer is responsible for the loss of the hack. Somebody breaks into your PBX, and in 2011 we had a great example, um, which will come up in a second. Um, somebody got up in the room and said, my company was hacked for $400,000 in two days. Our parent company went in and put a asterisk PBX into our server room, locked it down, didn't give me the passwords, nobody updated it, nobody checked it. Over two years, lots of things had changed. There were a number of exploits discovered and patched, but nobody patched the system. So one weekend, they hacked in. The ITSP didn't notice the difference. And I'll get to this again in a second. The tier two carrier noticed it and cut them off. Okay? Which meant that they got two full days, $400,000 of hit. Okay? Major carriers, the, the tier twos, tier ones, pay hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars for expensive systems from Savidia, from some of these other companies, Amdocs, to do the analysis to prevent fraud and notice abnormal patterns. Most people who go out and do this at the enterprise level are using smaller carriers, tier threes, tier fours. They don't have the technology to monitor it, and by the time it's caught, you are on the hook for tens, twenty, hundred thousand dollars. On average, we're seeing every time we hear a case, the average is about twenty-five thousand dollars of a hit for a one-day hit. Okay? The exception to when you are actually the customer is responsible was one case that happened uh, this year, uh, was decided in the UK. Now, the surprising thing is, this particular hack happened one week after Nir and I had that $400,000 conversation at Astrocon. So, this happened the weekend of Halloween 2011. Somebody hacked into a PBX system for a uh, furniture refinishing company made 10,000 calls for $35,000 to premium numbers in Poland. So it's like phone calls made in England, terminated in Poland to the tune of 35,000 pounds. The judge eventually decided that the customer was not responsible because the contract with the carrier was phrased loosely enough that the customer had strong enough passwords, had enough, had a firewall, had all of the bare minimum requirement to be normally ex reasonable, and the carrier was then responsible because all the contract said was, you have to take reasonable security measures. This is no longer the case, and they've now patched that in this particular carrier. Okay? This is the exception. Most carriers you run into the case, like this one, happened last March. Okay? Company in Norcross, uh, Georgia, very close to where we were for Astricon last year, got hit for 166,000 calls to premium rate numbers to Gambia, Somalia, and the Maldives. Okay? was hit literally, again, one weekend, $166,000 worth of calls. And now he's fighting it through the FCC and everybody else to try and say that he's not responsible, because this is the equivalent of 37 years worth of normal calls for them. Little company, 10 people, they make maybe $100 worth of calls a month. Okay? The law currently is not like credit cards. If you have a credit card stolen or somebody steals your uh, ID number, you can call up the credit card company, you're hit with $50, $500 maximum, and then you're not responsible, they're responsible for the difference if you've actually notified them. Telephone companies do not have that requirement. If you are hit, you are responsible. So the big question of who is responsible to pay, in the end it's you, and the problem is this can be enough to take a small company $100,000 is more than a year's profit for some companies. It will put them out of business. Okay? Things to watch out for that are new for this year, that are kind of strange. They're not specifically asterisks and PBX related, but there are a couple of strange things I thought I would point out. Okay? Somebody has started using fake base stations. Okay? Now understand, for all effective purposes, this is a PBX. People can hack into it using bad apps or whatever else, and then, without you knowing it, make outbound calls. It's, there's now a case of somebody has gone and created on the Google Play a app that will then record your video off of your camera without you knowing it using a one-pixel playback because Google requires that they have an on-screen display when you're recording from the camera. But it's one pixel, so whoever notices. 
So they can record everything you're doing, anything that's going on around you, listen to it, watch it. All because they've hacked into one particular app and made it possible. But here we've got a case of people putting up phony base stations. Phony base station means they are man in the middle attacking you, they get all of your voice and they can record it, all of your text messages and SMSs, all of your internet traffic goes through them, and unless it's encrypted, they can see it clear before passing it on to anybody else. Now, the amusing part of this is there's one located about 20 minutes from here near the South Point uh, Casino. Okay? They're also around almost every military base, the White House, and a bunch of other places, so they're not quite sure who's doing it or how it's happening. Okay? Detecting them is hard because it's uh, done at the baseband firewall level, so they need a special phone to even detect it. So just be aware that what you are doing is being captured or can be captured by the apps, by what else is going on on your smartphone. Okay, coming back to PBXs. How do they find you? You have a, this interesting little internet search engine called Shodan HQ. It's Google for devices. Okay, and one of the, at the bottom here they list uh, a bunch of popular uh, searches. One of them is Cisco default password. One of the most common things that people search for, and you will find 10,000 Cisco devices using the default password and advertising that fact. Okay, but to take it a little bit differently. So I did a couple searches. Elastics, okay. Uh, what is that? That's one trillion, no, one billion uh, devices are registering and announcing that this is what they are. Okay, free PBX, 150, uh, oh, I'm sorry. That's the IP address. This was 180. Elastics was 527. Okay. Free PBX is 180. PBX in a flash is only shows up for 25. Um, under PF, it was only 16. Um, and remember, as I said, somebody was able to go in here, look at the IP address shown, and hack into the Polycom. Okay. There are a number of basic resources available from within the Asterix community. Okay, and I'm sure this will be up uh, sometime in January. They usually get the videos up on this. Uh, I will be posting this and tweeting it out later. Okay, take the Asterix Advanced class. There's a whole segment now called Asterix Security Considerations, which talks about the overview, common threats, layer by layer security, physical operating system, all the way through. Asterix is got wonderful things built in. Digium is bothered to put out the training. Take the class. Okay, part of the standard Asterix advanced class. Uh, latest version which came out six months ago. Okay, look at the Asterix wiki. Okay, there's a framework discussion that uh, Malcolm wrote originally and it's out there talking about the various tools of how to configure your Asterix. Gives you overview, how to look at event generation, event logger, in the log, look at the uh, format, okay? The tools are there. Secure calling specifics, again, Malcolm put this out. Channel specific configurations, security-based dial plan branching. Remember, the difference between capital T, lowercase t, is a very important configuration in your dial plan. Who's allowed to transfer the call and when? The person calling, the person receiving, inbound, outbound, it's important to understand the difference. Okay, there's a whole tutorial listed using TLS, using the keys, the SIP configuration, SRTP. These are the technologies that are going to make things secure today. Okay, uh, Malcolm and Rusty did a absolutely wonderful thing. It will be updated for 12 and 13 as it goes on, but this is valid today. Okay, and you'll notice I made a point of putting the links on every one of these, so when I tweet out the link to the PowerPoint, you'll be able to see these. Okay. Pay attention to when your vendors send out warnings or put them on your screen. How many people here use one of the GUIs? Elastics, FreePBX, PF, um, okay. Pay attention. This came out um, last week. Um, FreePBX, very good at giving you notifications on the main board. So here you had a update uh, talking about critical vulnerability uh, for zero day remote. Uh, I know Philip is going to talk much deeper about zero days and stuff in his talk. Uh, this afternoon. He's the first one after lunch, I think. 
Okay? So this is about the uh, PBX ARI. Okay? Operating system level. How many of you are doing this on CentOS? Okay? How many of you actually bothered to look to see whether or not Shellshock bothers your system? Okay? Apparently, and again, Philip will be talking more about these. These particular things, Shellshock, uh, Poodle, all of these things will hit a small percentage of us, but they do hit some of our systems, some of the apps and things that we connect to, some of the carriers. Pay attention, okay? Remember to do your YUM updates and pay attention to any custom configurations that may be broken when you do updates on core and things, okay? When we were doing the security audits and uh, the last couple of years I've been talking about those, we found that in some places, 117 critical operating failures were available at the OS level, okay? People hadn't updated their Apache. They hadn't updated their CentOS. They were still running four or five. Uh, all sorts of things that have been patched or updated. If you're out there, Shodan tells what operating system you're running. If you advertise it as a PBX, it will tell what flavor PBX, and in some cases, what version, okay? During DevCon, there was a question of how many people are running old versions or um, standard versions of some of the asterisk stuff. Okay? There are still people running 1.2 and 1.4 out there. Okay? This is stuff that was depreciated more than five years ago, end of life to more than seven. Okay? Old stuff that should not be out there still, people went and did custom development, custom applications on it, and have never taken the time to update those so they can't upgrade. Which means they are open to any security fault that has been found in the last five years. Okay? Watch for the ins and install regular updates. Okay? Uh, PBX in a flash. Uh, free PBX are really good at letting you know when there are things to update. Pay attention. They are trying to protect you and do what they can to cover their ass to cover your ass. Okay? Do not ignore OS updates. No, you don't have to move everything to the latest version of CentOS 7. If you're still running 6 or 6.5, do a YUM update to make sure everything is at the most clean, the most patched version. And then remember to do some regression testing to make sure all of your extensions, all of your dial plans, and everything else still work. Anything you've done custom. Okay? And watch the news. I have a Google um, alert set up for phishing attacks, for hacks, for PBX fraud, for phone fraud. I get so many updates daily on things called telecom fraud or phone fraud, it's not funny. 90% of these are the somebody is using a telephone to commit fraud, which isn't relevant to us, but it's one of those things that you tell your family. If somebody calls you and says, Grandma, I'm uh, in jail in Mexico, please wire me money and don't tell mom, uh, and they want you to use Western Union, chances are it's a hoax. Okay? I'm, the, I'm calling from the IRS. We've discovered that you owe us $10,000. If you do not send it to us immediately, you, we will put a lien on your house and seize your home. Okay, in Israel, we had a, a kind of thing. We have, um, like in the UK, we have TV tax. So about eight years ago, the tax authority was stopping people on the highway. You had a police car sitting there with a cop, and they would stop people. Can you prove to me that you have paid your TV tax? No. Pay it to me now, or I'm seizing your car. And he'll make sure it's legal. The cop knew nothing about what was being said. He's there because he was sent to make sure that there was no traffic violations and no danger from the person stopping people. Turns out that they were 100% scamming people. They did not have the authority to collect on the spot. They did not have the authority to seize your car. People are doing the same thing over the telephone. Every friggin' newspaper has come out in the last year, such and such has warned about. This community is warning about. The police are calling and warning. UK, US, especially in the, in the South where you've got retirement communities, people are trying to take advantage of old people who don't understand. But they're not limiting it. Okay? Pay attention to some of the products that are out there that you can use to protect yourself. Okay? For the larger situations, going out and getting a um, Cisco or a checkpoint firewall is a mandatory thing. For smaller operations, you're using uh, smaller open source firewalls, that's fine, okay? Uh, Philip and I were, to, were joking that this is the year that failed to ban, failed to come to Astrocon. Some years we have five topics of different people talking about things with failed to ban. There are none today. Failed to ban is not enough to save you, so nobody's talking about it as a product that should. So pay attention, okay? Know about some of the problems that there are. 
Palo Alto has a known problem with working with SIP. We ran into some serious problems in Sao Paulo on a customer trying to make SIP trunks work because the media was going and getting blocked by the Palo Alto, and we could not work with that. Okay, Checkpoint seems to work fine. Fail to ban causes some strange problems, and we've got a couple of customers who end up running into some known bugs that we just cannot kill because it's, it's inherent to the technology. Okay? If you have a single PBX or just a phone, and a lot of people are doing things with Vonage or uh, these little individual PBX um, VoIP phones, there are new things that you can do. Okay? Coordinate it with your phone company or your internet provider. Make sure that your configurations are managed. Ports are open. Your NAT is configured. Do things to make sure this works. This is not at the asterisk level. This is straight at the IP level, at your actual connectivity. Okay? A couple of products to keep an eye on. You have the uh, Allo, who is downstairs actually exhibiting. Um, they have the new uh, STM, SIP Threat Manager. Does all sorts of snort-based, real-time deep packet inspection to do some things. And they were kind enough to give me this, so I'll go through it real quickly. Okay. Basic concept of firewall. A little black box, about this big. Scans the packets. Notice that something is wrong. Takes it out, identifies it, puts it into its memory. Next time it sees it, it kills it. So you'll notice the, the line coming down when it sees one and knocks the packet out. Very basic firewall technology. They're doing it with the packet. They're setting it up. Um, talk to the guys downstairs. They do a very nice product. Okay? Another one to keep your eye on. Pika, who was uh, in Atlanta. I didn't see them here this year. Um, they put out a nice little box, not much bigger than this. You plug an Ethernet cable on one end and on the other end out to your router, and it works, again, looks at the protocol. These things strictly are working at the SIP level. Neither one of them is really doing a whole lot on TLS yet, things like that. These are first-generation products. But they're useful, and they are relatively cheap. You're talking under $300 for one of these to protect yourself from $35,000 worth of fraud. It's an insurance plan that you put in. Okay? Um, I already mentioned the PHP ARI uh, and voting for us in our sandbox uh, for part of the hackathon competition here. Um, this is a shameless plug. Any questions? Say again? We were specifically told to advertise and to talk about it. The fact that Billy went and put it on the big screen in front of the keynote and said, vote here using our particular page, this was very surprising to us and we were very pleased. But since we didn't get one of the first three prizes, we figured, okay, we'll take the votes we can get. Um, Okay. They choose probably the weekends so that way people don't note it. They, they probably choose the weekends so that way like it's less noticeable, right? Very much so. Okay. Yeah. We've had cases where um, organizations are closed for long holiday weekends or things and people will hack the system. They will do it overnight. You need to know whitelist, uh, blacklisting for times. You need to look at products that will monitor when abnormal times, what are your business hours. Uh, in the past, we've talked about Humbug, which monitors things. You tell it what your normal business hours are. Look at these things. Most companies have the anything between Friday at 7 o'clock p.m. until sun, uh, Monday morning, 7 a.m., 9 a.m. is you should not have any calls except. Okay? And you need to know who the except are and what they're allowed to do. Okay? You have a help desk. You have a customer support number. They should be allowed to receive things or call out. The receptionist, not so much so. The president's secretary, never do anything to screw over the president's secretary. Okay? The president doesn't care if he can't make calls on a off time or whatever, but if the secretary gets annoyed, your name is mud. Okay? But you need a tool that will monitor this. There are a couple of things for inbound within free PBX, within Elastix and these, but you need to actually have some sort of rule because you really can't turn it off. Okay, and then for some smaller businesses uh, or medium-sized businesses, there's not a lot of international calling that has to happen. Maybe limiting that to different Definitely. users, maybe not even on the weekends at all. But you, you said something about 
like say somebody in Nigeria could set up a 900 number there too, so that would look more local than maybe no, an no, international. No, no, you still have the country code. Okay, so there still would be a country code yeah. in most of these cases. Th that's just it. It's an international. That if you're a U.S.-based company and you don't have anything else out much outside, you could block that, and that you would can, help probably a lot. Some of this, if you really want to go to the effort, um, going into dial plan, you can set up dial plan rules for the any call going to these countries, block or. Do it the other way, block everything unless it's a white list and list. I want to allow plus one, I want to allow local calls, I want to allow things. I don't want to allow one uh, 900 or 805 numbers or things like that because that's the Caribbean and that's still five bucks a minute. Um, trying to blacklist everything line by line yeah. will drive you crazy. Yeah. If you blacklist all and then whitelist the things you need, you will find out when one of your people goes, hey, I need to call but I can't, you know when you need to add something to the whitelist. Now, for my business, I'm able to have, like, it's a flex line, it's basically like a PRI, and that's only internal, I don't have to hit the internet, I'm not doing SIP, but I did have a case at home where I was using a SIP provider, they couldn't give me IP addresses to only allow SIP to them because it was a smaller situation, they, they couldn't have, have an exact range, and I did get somebody who tried making calls out, now luckily I didn't allow international calling, but, so yeah. I have even seen that just at home. Well, part of that is, is you have to make sure your contract with your uh, ITSP or your carrier doesn't allow things that you don't want to allow. And I've seen cases where people will n do not allow international calls. Why are you sending me a bill for 5,000 international calls? Oh, you made the calls. No, I didn't. I've got that blocked. And then you can win. Okay? Make sure it's written and documented up front. Okay? Bottom line, your PBX, your responsibility. Cover your ass as much as you can in writing. Do not accept the, okay, I've turned it off over the phone when you talk to customer service. Ask for a confirmation email to, to verify this because your lawyers or your people will need it when you go back and say, hey, guys, this is what you said. This is what happened. I'm not liable. You are. Okay, Philip, you had a question? The current free PBX hack, um, before I flew out, there was a manual fix for it. It wasn't automatically updated in the GUI. Do you know if that was automatically put in the GUI now? Um, I don't think it was yet. Okay. I know that it, it should come out in, the, in like within a, a week or so, but they don't like to do automatic until they've tested it, made sure it really works. Um, they're medium conservative that way, so they don't like sticking something out that's going to screw it up worse. Um, there were a couple of things in uh, PBX and a Flash where they were much more proactive in that and testing it harder for the fixes there. Uh, especially at the operating system level. Uh, Ward is really good at, oh shit, there's a problem, let's make this more secure as quickly as I can. Uh, Schmooze being a much bigger organization with um, lawyers and the board of directors to play with has to make sure a little more conservative they can't be quite so uh, immediately responsive. They have to make sure it really works and doesn't make it worse. Um, this is a good thing in most cases. Uh, but you have to be aware of the limitations uh, of what's being rolled out and when. Other questions? What's your opinion on limiting uh, number of calls per second and is there good software for doing that in a, say, a free PBX type system? Uh, limiting number of calls inbound or outbound per duration, per destination is an important thing. Uh, you really have to understand your business logic to make that work. Uh, this is one of the things that when we were in Humbug, we had thresholds for number of calls and alerting you if you went over X number of calls, X number of dollars per hour, per day, per month, uh, to destinations, per uh, sources, things of that nature. It's important to monitor and uh, some of the things where you can actually block the calls. Uh, you really should, but it requires that you actually have a clue as to what your business is. Uh, if you're a plumber in the middle of Nebraska, uh, there should be no calls to Afghanistan. Okay, that's obvious. That's not necessarily the case for calls to Canada. Okay, how many calls, how many people, if you have a call center, uh, one of the things that we were looking at, especially with call centers related to banking and credit card, okay, how many inbound calls do you allow per hour from the same phone number? I'm, a, I'm somebody calling in saying I'm such and such customer, I need a little help with doing a wire transfer, Okay, authenticate, you get a little, they get a little more information before getting disconnected. They call back a minute later, get a different rep, now they've got two pieces of information to try and authenticate. 
They get hung up, they try again, they get three pieces of information. And eventually after seven, eight, nine calls in an hour, they've got enough information to uh, basically steal the identity to make the call to actually do a wire transfer. So you have to pay attention to these things, especially if you're dealing with banks, credit cards, or things where finance is involved. Um, so the number of inbound calls there is more important than the number of outbound calls. Uh, but again, this is understanding the way people do the hacking, do the phishing, rather than the actual PBX level. But you have to monitor it at the PBX level with some sort of call monitoring. Um, if you're doing a call center system, it will tell you number of calls, but it won't usually tell you source uh, phone numbers coming in or, source num or numbers going out. So you need something a little bit more than the standard call center applications. And the heads-up displays don't tell you anything. They just tell you total number of calls, who's on, how many are on queue, and stuff like that. You can get the same person a dozen times in an hour, and you'll never know it. Other questions? OK. The two I showed. One second. OK. The Allo STM, SIP Threat Manager. Uh, they're actually demonstrating it down in the expo hall uh, now. Uh, very nice little box. Um, the other one is from Pika. Allo is based out of India. They do a very nice product. Um, the guys at Pika are based out of Canada. Very smooth, very uh, classic looking device. Uh, they take the approach slightly differently on what they're looking for and how they're doing it. And they're both on the process of going first generation to second to third with new monitoring tools and updates that happen regularly. Can you nest them? That's a good question. They're both, pa they're both passed through and they put a couple of millisecond delays as they uh, deep pack it through. Uh, might work. Um, never thought of that. It's an interesting idea. because They do about 80% of the same thing. Is that 20% difference over that, that isn't overlap to extend it, is it worth it? I don't know. I, I would actually have to, to test to see how much it slows down if it breaks the actual links. How are we doing on time? Probably time for one or two more questions. On the uh, SIP security devices, how many concurrent calls or CPS can one of those devices handle? Is there any specs on that? Um, I don't have them here. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they've got them on their site. One second. The problem with the Pico one is they use the Greek letter mu, so it's a little harder to get the internet. Um, threat manager, SIP threat manager. Well, as you see, they're advertising here. And next week, they're down in um, Santiago. Come on. OK. Um, Layer 2 device, DDoS. Okay, throughput is 10 megs. 50 concurrent calls on this box. Are you asking? Probably have time for one more question if anyone has a question. Okay, you want to ask anybody else? While I'm typing this up. We were talking about monitoring your systems after hours, and while that's extremely important, as an ITSP, you know, we, we monitor our traffic real time over the wire. And five years ago, it used to be like clock, clockwork. At five o'clock, you would start seeing it happen. But nowadays, it's, it's even during work hours. And we get so many attacks, attack attempts during work hours. I think it's Important to mention that we need to re remain vigilant over those hours as well. Oh, 
definitely. It's just um, strange calls to strange places are frequently odd hours. Um, a large part of the, the, what we're seeing is the cleaning lady at 11 o'clock at night sits down and go, calls the relatives back home, wherever that may be, uh, or the distant cousins, and talks for an hour. Okay? This is a legitimate made call from your PBX, legitimately from inside, but called to some place that you don't normally call for a long period of time so it has a high dollar value. Okay? During the day, these things happen. Okay? And if you suddenly notice that you're getting problems with concurrent calls or things like that, chances are somebody is hacking your system and, and using it to make lots of calls and killing your bandwidth. So it's definitely, he's right. It, um, the big thing of the off hours is they get full access with nobody noticing. During the day, there's tons of stuff. And that, that's not even going anywhere near cramming or other nonsense that happens. Um, Okay, this page doesn't seem to give. I think at this point we better call it, but uh, you can certainly okay. find this information on Pika's website or on uh, Allah's website. So Eric, thank you very much. No problem.